How you doing, sir? Taking it well. You know, we're getting ready for a hurricane. That's how we're taking it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you, you guys will probably get the uh, the storm afterwards. Yeah, we'll get remnants. That'll help my my dead grass revive its <laughs> revive itself. <laughs> Arrow, are you in South Florida? No, I, we're in Carolina, so we'll we'll get the tropical storms, and and okay. and and they're already telling us by by Friday the winds will hit us. Saturday we'll have really bad winds, so we're we're just getting prepared for it. Got it. Yep. So we're, um, Arrow, you got twenty minutes, so you're the last one. So go for it. All right, I'm taking three hours then. All right, how you guys doing? <laughs> Oh, we're both Miami boys, so we sympathize with the uh, hurricane preparedness. Oh my God! Mm-hmm. And, and you guys are still down there. You're not. Gonna, you're not going to run or what? Nah, we live in LA now. We 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 ran to the fires we ran. Yeah. <laughs> and the droughts. Yeah, as Mark Marin says, as we dry up out here in California. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> so where were you guys at when the idea to create this podcast came to you? Because, I mean, I didn't know this story, but but in listening to there's there's three episodes up. This is this is real. And I, I really like the way that you guys have dove into this. Well, strangely enough, Arrow, it starts with another actor's autobiography. A friend of mine reached out and said, have you, have you read Danny Trejo's autobiography yet? I said, no, I haven't. And he said, I think you need to read especially the chapter titled American Me. Um, and when I did, I was dumbfounded. You know, he, he, he here's Danny Trejo, who's not in the movie American Me, who is in the movie Blood and Blood Out, uh, giving an account of interactions that he had with Edward James almost in the early 90s where he allegedly, according to him, warned almost not to make America Me about the Mexican mafia, mm-hmm. a real life prison and street gang, um, because it was very dangerous and could lead to people getting hurt, and that almost essentially ignored his warnings. And as a result, Trejo claimed that up to 10 people were mm-hmm. killed in connection with the film. So when I heard that, you know, I. It raised a bunch of questions, you know, uh, why would, if true, why would almost ignore these uh, warnings, you know, if not true, why would Danny Trejo include this in his autobiography, uh, and and what really happened, um, and also, you know, here are two guys who are sort of pioneers in, in, the, in the Latino acting space, and certainly Mr. Olmos, who is a legend, right, um, and in a caliber uh, on his own, you know, here are guys who 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 could have had a he could have had a prolific directing career, mm-hmm. and after American Me, he really did not, unfortunately, at least not at the theatrical level. So, you know, all of that together really uh, uh, made us very interested in exploring the real story behind American Me. Well, it's it's such an incredible story because I mean, it, it shows how how when you put reality on the screen you know people believe it i mean it's like the the, the movie warriors how much of that was authentic and and so i'm going to go back and rewatch this after i listen to your podcast all the way through because i want to go in there as an educated viewer now and not somebody who's going oh cool man it's about a gang yeah right totally. I mean, go ahead nigel go ahead alec okay. well the, the the way this movie was originally <clears throat> depicted to us like Alec was saying from the Trejo biography was or autobiography was was more like almost like the Twilight Zone movie disaster right it it was brought to us and the way he describes it is something totally avoidable that the director has ultimate responsibility for that people die and just as we're picking this up you know it it doesn't necessarily look that way right people did die and the movie did come out and it did anger people but it's that one-to-one connection that we're not so sure that we think is a little bit tenuous and that's part of what we're exploring yeah now, are you going to talk with Danny? I've been with Danny a couple of times. My God, that guy! When when you get him onto the subject of of the reality of the streets, you're you're going to get a story. Yeah, you know, we have reached out to Danny Trejo uh, two times now, um, and unfortunately, you know, despite having gone on a series of podcasts to promote his book to talk about this story, he, he you know he has declined uh, through his reps to speak to us. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's a function of us, you know, getting other accounts of what happened at that time and wanting to kind of cross check them with him or not, um, or if he's just busy, you know, he's a busy guy, busy actor. Um, but thus far, he hasn't wanted to do it. You know, Danny, if you're listening, we're 
we're more than open to talking to you. Uh, but we do have some questions because several of the accounts that we got about what happened and and what transpired, you know, they don't quite add up uh, one for one with his account. Do you feel like journalists in, in, in the way that you, you are diving into a story to uncover the truth? Well, <laughs> I mean, I'll let Nigel field this because Nigel is is uh, an award winning actual investigative oh, okay. and regular journalist. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'll let I'll I'll let him address that. I'm I'm a documentary filmmaker, so journalist adjacent, but Ni Nigel's the real deal here, bona fide. Oh boy, uh, yeah. So in this, I think that's what struck my curiosity and Alex's curiosity is. This is a story not just about this movie, right? It's also mm -hmm. a contextual story about Los Angeles in the early 90s. This movie comes out in March of 92. In April of 92 is the big uprising in the streets of LA. And in May of 92, people started dying They were connected with this movie. Mm -hmm. So that's a three month period that if you're a reporter, that's pretty darn interesting. You know, you wanna know more about it. And so uh, journalistically, yeah, I think that in, in reporting out this story and doing it, we're certainly talking to the actors, we're bringing in the movie folks, the Hollywood side. But the side that, that, that really interests me is, is what happened sort of on the street here. Who were the main players? We managed to talk to some folks who couldn't give us their names, but they've explained what happened from their perspective, whether they were in prison at the time or they knew the people of Philly. And frankly, as we've been reporting this, we've been told a number of times, stop doing this, yes. don't report this anymore, yep. right? Yep. Back out of this. Um, people who just grew up in East LA that I know down at the bar will tell me, oh, he has a podcast going. Oh, okay, you're still alive. That's good. Yeah. You know, buy me a beer. So, <laughs> so, so it is one of those things where we want to be respectful of the material. We want to be respectful of the situation that happened, and we certainly want to take into account that Edward James almost hasn't talked to us about this because he says he can't do it. Not that he won't do it, but that he can't do it. And so we're trying to figure out exactly why he can't. We're getting closer, I think. And we're trying to sort of report this story out as if we're doing one big magazine feature, but instead we're putting it, you know on the radio. Well, see, and that's what I love about podcasting is the fact that, you know, I mean, sure, we still have, you know, directions and stuff like that in formats that we have to follow, but but the voice gets to be inflected. It's not words on a page. We get to hear your guys' story, and, and you guys are good storytellers. I mean, it's I, I know what your background is, but when you guys go into that podcast, you're going in there making that one-on-one -on -one connection with that listener that's sitting in the front seat of a car. Absolutely. And, you know, I appreciate that. This is my first podcast, you know, as a host. So, uh, you know, it's definitely virgin territory for me. Um, and I have to say, I think a lot of it is just the connection to the material, mm -hmm. you know, I think because I'm a filmmaker myself and because this story isn't just for me about, uh, you know, the kind of controversy surrounding it, but really about missed opportunities and what could have been, you know, this is a, a film directed by a guy I really admire in Edward James Olmos yep. with a almost completely uh, Latino cast, uh, almost completely Latino crew uh, with a Latino story. And it could have been our Godfather, Goodfellas. It could have launched a bunch of careers and a slew of movies afterwards for almost the direct. And that didn't happen. And mm -hmm. with representation levels as kind of palette as they are today, you know, I was just saying, uh, you know, we have about 4.4% of on-screen roles are Hispanic or, you know, Latino, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and we are 18 point. This is from 2019. We were 18.9 percent of the population. We're one in five Americans, and yet we represent mm -hmm. less than one in 20 roles on screen. So when I look at American Me, it's it's easy to kind of tell the story with that kind of inflection because it it, it gets under my skin, you yeah, know. Yeah, and, and listeners need to understand. I'm talking with millennials as well as Gen Zers, and that is is that Edward he he is and was a voice for the community and that there was a purpose and a plan behind the authenticity of American me. I, I mean, absolutely. And and that's maybe part of what did it in a little bit is that verisimilitude, that, 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 that hewing closer to reality, right? I mean, these guys aren't going to get mad if you make a, a, a movie that came out right around the same time called blood in blood out. That movie is describing the Trejo doc, you know, a uh, book as cute, right? It's, it's, it's almost like a cartoon of yeah. what someone would imagine that's the street in LA is like, but these guys tried to play it straight. They tried to play it serious. They tried to say, you know, they used almost exactly the real names and the, the characters and the depiction, you know, there's a real life guy that had a peg leg that was, you know, had white skin and lived in the, in the barrio. That's the person that was depicted on the screen. So it's almost like they, 
they got closer and closer to the material, and that partly may be one of the things that upset the game. So are, are you saying even Jacob, when he played Polito, I mean, it was like, it, it, was that an authentic character, do you know? Or I mean, what, what happened? For Jacob Vargas, Alex, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that the Paulito, the Paulito character is based on someone specifically. What I know is that Jacob acted in that film with a bunch of actual members mm-hmm. of the Hazard Prison Gang, right? Like the guys who are around Jacob. Jacob Vargas plays essentially a member of the new generation, you know, um, after Santana, which is Edward James Olmos's character, um, and uh, and and Santana's little. Little brother, I believe, right, Nigel, if I'm not mistaken, and um, yep, and and so, but but the the cast around him, a lot of those guys are bona fide gangsters, and in fact, at the end of the movie, there's a very famous scene um, where Jacob is driving the getaway car, and they do a drive by mm. on some unsuspecting folks. That kid was shot and blinded. After this film came out, not not oh my God. not as any kind of retribution for the film, um, just because he was living that life, and so he never actually got to see the film um, because of that. So you know, I think what what really strikes us is is that almost went to great lengths to make this as true to life as possible in the hopes of of actually scaring kids off yeah. from joining these gangs. But I think he he ultimately succeeded in telling really compli- a really complicated human story about these characters that drew people into the movie. So you have this tension between those two forces, you know? So now, as you do the research, the shock and awe for you has got to be amazing because, I mean, I mean, to, to put this together and then to do it in a story form, what, how, how do you dig in while looking over your shoulder at the same time? Because there's got to be people knocking on your door going, what are you doing? What are you doing now? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it, it hasn't been so much people knocking on our doors. That would be that would be the, the, the escalation. Um, but I think at this point, uh, the reporting that, that Alex has done, that I have done, um, you know, a lot of it is, of course, you know, archival. We're looking through the stuff because some of this stuff was reported at the time. People were right. saying Edward James almost is in hiding, that he applied for a concealed carry weapon permit. You know, so all this stuff was out there. But time buries things right and then and and also people's memories you know weren't necessarily out there so we've had to do a little bit of coaxing and some calling and people have moved to ohio and they're afraid to talk and oh well if you get this guy's permission in prison then i'll talk to you so it has been kind of that experience but i think for us personally look we're here to tell a story we're not here to sort of reinstigate whatever crimes they think that edward james almost committed against them we're just trying to explain what happened at the time. And I think that if you do that and you do it truthfully, you'll be okay. So it's I not it's, it's not going to be like a crime podcast where if they see you guys come walking in, it's like, oh, crap, we're in trouble. They're going to start digging. All right, who's talking? Who's not talking? I don't I don't think so. I mean, look, for the 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 if anyone, I think it's maybe the Hollywood types, you know, uh, who uh, who might who might have more of that feeling that I've gotten warned, you know, not by members of La Amy, but by, you know, folks who experienced this firsthand, who I think maybe were traumatized by it 30 years ago, mm. you know, and continue to be concerned for really the well-being of Edward James Olmos, you know, which speaks to the loyalty of the folks around him, right? Like they're saying to me, I don't want to put Eddie in danger. And frankly, I don't want to put you in danger, right. you know? Right. Um, which I which I appreciate and I respect. However, you know, um, as far as we know, you know, from from speaking to a former member of Laime, uh, who was who had who had direct knowledge of this situation, um, you know, Laime didn't ha- hate the movie. They actually, some of them may have even liked the fact that it sort of put them on black, you know, put their name on the map uh, in a bigger way. What they took issue with was Edward James Olmos's attempts to emasculate them through the film, mm. right? You know, and that that was the real problem. So, you know, I think as far as us as storytellers, and you know, I'm I'm a doc filmmaker. I, I you know I get sued pretty much every time I make something. <laughs> uh, so, like you know, for for us, I, I think we're treating current and former members of the Mexican Mafia. I hope they think with respect. You know. Um, uh, with respect and and trying actually to get to the truth of the of their real story, not necessarily what was uh, skewed for entertainment purposes in the film. 
In future episodes, will you put focus on how the impact of American Me, uh, you know, made its presence in our lives across the country? Because all of a sudden, I, I swear, and I, I do remember, fashion changed because everybody thought, well, I'm, I'm wearing this because they did. I'm going to do this because they did. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I think that's a big piece of it, you know. Um, uh, I think, like, uh, it's also sparked uh, a, a series of of other genre type mm-hmm. movies, you know, um, and, and I think that, um, it, it, again, is that double-edged sword of, uh, this is not necessarily the prettiest part of our community, but it is, uh, there's a culture to it. There's a style to it, you know, like anyone who wants to say that Montoya Santana in that movie isn't cool, you know what I mean? In the way he carries himself, he's kidding themselves, yeah. you know? So, I think there's a certain amount of of uh, of of ways in which that not only like you know uh, uh, put the the culture in the zeitgeist, but also I think it, it it influenced the culture itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, because I I didn't know what tagging was until until we started seeing things like this in the movie, and I mean, and then now you know tagging is a, is a huge part, and we I mean we've got experts in our police forces here that that really actually read into the story. Um, yeah, and, and and so, uh, sorry. So the question being that, of course, like like this movie bringing out elements of the culture. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I I think it, I it, you know it's like the the martial arts movies. I mean, I mean, you know, really. I mean, if, if you if you study martial arts movies, I just saw a documentary over the weekend and and how it started in ballet, and and it's like what? And and see, that's what I love about your podcast is you're giving me that what factor as well. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, I mean, impact wise. Right. So so Alex and I are of the age where we saw Karate Kid when we were children, we're immediately enrolled and given a gi and a white belt and everything. Right. <laughs> so with, with this movie, I, 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 th- they didn't want that. They didn't want kids joining up, like Alex said. They, 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 they didn't want people being attracted to this, but they did a pretty good job with it. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, from what we talked to, at least the, the people our age, when it's a cult classic, it's like you said, people do want to emulate it. So in a way, this kind of backfired. It, it, he wanted to make a movie to convince people to stay away from gangs, but in some ways, he did make some inducements toward it. Yeah, yeah. What have you guys personally learned? They're, they're, because you, you don't go into the, a project like this without being students. Absolutely. I mean... I think we're still learning, you know, we're actually still making the podcast. It's not done yet. Um, but I think, I think what I, I'm taking away from it is that first of all, hindsight's 2020, mm-hmm. right? So any sort of judgment that folks want to pass on Edward James almost, you know, it's easy to do when you're looking back 30 years, you know? Um, but the, the other thing is just that um, it's, it's easier said than done to try to make a movie that has uh, an agenda. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do with this podcast is rather than, and I think, you know, what we try to do with all our work is rather than go into something with a kind of activist agenda to go into it, trying to tell a good story. And, and I think that Edward James almost because he's so passionate, Mm -hmm. genuinely lives and breathes Latino, culture and rights and you know um opportunity i think he went into this with an agenda first and a story second and i think that 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 backfired in a way that's very unusual you know in a way in real life usually the way that backfires is people don't see the movie in this case some folks saw the movie and did not care for certain parts of it you know so that's the takeaway for me well the one thing the one thing that always happens in a movie like this is is i call it the telephone game people will say yeah i saw the movie and then the conversation starts and by the time it gets to the 10th person nine of those people didn't see the movie but they've got an opinion yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely or they don't even remember the movie or they or they confuse it with blood in blood yeah. out you know i mean it's like it, it absolutely and when you dig into it this is a this is a movie that's real rich. I mean, this guy this guy convinced the warden of Folsom Folsom Prison to let him shoot in the yard oh with real god. prisoners. Oh my god! This is like you know, the, there's no end to to the lengths to which Edward James almost went to try to make this movie the quintessential Chicano gang movie. You know, mm-hmm. and and frankly, I think he succeeded. I think he succeeded. 
Wow. Well, Edward, if you're listening, dude, come on. You, you got to share the story. Somewhere along the line, you got to share the story or someone's going to write it for him. <laughs> I hope he listens to you. <laughs> <laughs> guys, you, you guys have got to come back to the show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate it. This was a great time uh, talking to you. Absolutely. Be brilliant today, okay? Thank you. We'll try. Thanks, man. Thanks. Bye-bye.